And the next idea we're going to look at is something called the Gilbreth Principle. Now, it ends up that you don't have to have 12 cards <laughs> for, to use this principle. Um, and it, it, depending on how you set it up, it may be an even size packet or an odd. Now, the way I'm going to do this first one, it's going to be even. And I actually decided to go with 12 cards because it's not too hard to do that. Um, so I have this 12 card packet here. Okay. So I'm going to kind of mix the cards. Now, what I want you to do is um, just kind of look at this through the eyes of the spectator. So I'm not necessarily going to, you know, explain what's happening at each stage right now, but we'll go back and look at what's going on. But I'm just mixing the cards here. Okay. And now what I want you to do is I'm going to start dealing out these cards and you tell me when to stop dealing. Stop. Sure. You want one more? No? You're happy with that? Okay. So I've dealt out a number of cards. So what you do is you just spin these and then you just bring them together. Just kind of bring them together. They'll often bump up against each other. Um, bring them together. And so I, I've mixed the cards. You know, I kind of scrambled them at the beginning. And then you told me how many to deal. You told me when to stop. And then we did this rosette shuffle that just kind of randomly brings those together. And I think you could tell that, you know, I don't think anyone could, was controlling how those cards were being interlaced. And I wasn't. It was a bit of a mess, really. I want to play a game with you and just see how lucky you are. Um, now, what we're going to do is we're going to pull off pairs of cards from the top. And uh, you're free to choose um, what will constitute a winning pair for you and what will constitute a winning pair for me. So, for example, we could say um, you win the pair if they're opposite colors and I win the pair if they're the same color or vice versa. Okay. So if you were here, I'd have you choose which one you wanted. Since you're not, we'll just say um, you win if they're of opposite color. And I win if the two cards are the same color. Okay. So let's just see how that game would play out for the two of us and assume that you chose uh, cards of opposite color. Was that a good choice? Okay. So I'm just pushing off two cards. Ooh. Okay. That's a winning pair for you. So you have one, one win so far. Okay. What about the next pair? <laughs> You've got two wins. Okay. What about the next pair? No way. You got three. Okay. Right now, <laughs> you've won half of the pairs that are possible. Okay. I have one zero. Let's try this one. I mean, surely we're going to get matching colors at some point. You win the fourth pair. Okay. That is, I was going to say, my luck has got to change here. You win that one. And I think by elimination, you must. You must, how in the world did you do that? Okay, so just think about all the different ways these cards could have come off as pairs, especially with the mixing that we did that you had played an integral part of. How did you win every single hand? Okay, well, it's the Gilbreth principle that guarantees this outcome right here. And so if you do what I did at the beginning with the packet structure I had, this will always happen. This will always happen that each pair will consist of one of each color. Well, it ends up that knowing that much, there are so many really fun, surprising routines and performances that can and have been created using the Gilbreth principle. So there's many effects on YouTube right now where the, the engine driving it is the Gilbreth principle. Okay. So this is, so you might be able to kind of guess what kind of packet structure I had at the start. And um, it deals with cyclic constructions. Now, of course, I have a little hint over here. Um, please don't ask me why I chose red for black and <laughs> blue for red. But um, so this is supposed to be red, black, red, black. So what I started with actually was something like this, an alternating packet of red and black. So that's what I began with. But what about the mixing I did at the beginning? How could I do that mixing and not like destroy this 
alternating structure. Well, I did a Charlier shuffle, right? And if you've been watching the other videos in the boot camp series, you know that each of these is equivalent to an ordinary just cutting somewhere, cutting of the cards. Well, it ends up that cutting the cards will not harm an alternating structure like this. It will still be alternating. Now, it's true that maybe the top card will be black and then the next one red versus red black, but it still alternates in color. That's the key, okay? So that Charlier shuffle was just to give the impression that the cards are being mixed, which they are, but it's not harming the structure that we want. And then, what? if you remember what I did was, I started to deal them out. This is a key, key step. If you don't do this kind of step, it won't work. The Gilbreth principle will not apply. So what I did is something called reverse counting, right? Let me just kind of point that out really fast. So I, as you deal out cards, uh, it reverses the order of the cards. So this was the top, right, top. This was second from the top. Now it's gonna be second from the bottom and so forth. It's reversing the order of those cards. And that's needed for the Gilbert's principle to actually work. And so it doesn't matter how many cards you reverse count. That's incredibly surprising, but it's true. Um, so I could have done four, five, six, seven, none of them, one of them, that kind of thing. And then at this point, the key mixing is anything that's equivalent to a riffle shuffle. Okay, so a riffle shuffle, as I mentioned, is where you have a packet of cards, you kind of break them in half a little bit, and then you do this sort of action. Sometimes people will bridge them. That's a riffle shuffle. Well, it ends up that there's a number of ways of accomplishing that same outcome as far as being you know, equivalent to a riffle shuffle. So what I did was something called a rosette shuffle. I went through and did this and it will actually do the same thing as a riffle shuffle. Um, the thing to focus on is the riffle shuffle for the packet on the left and on the right, you know, when I, when I break that up, so just kind of watch this for a second. So when I do this, the cards on the right, their relative order will not be disturbed. Like this card on top will always be above these other cards below. The same thing here. Now it's true they're gonna be interlaced, but the cards on the right will never switch places with cards on the right, and cards on the left will never switch places with cards on the left. Well, that's what's happening with this ros rosette shuffle, right? I just spin them, and I'm maintaining the relative order of the cards in that half, or that portion, and maintaining the relative order of the cards in this portion. And so now you just bring them together, and so it really will be like a, uh, like, letting them fall left, right, left, right in some random fashion. So that actually is equivalent to a riffle shuffle, which is what we need for the Gilbreth principle to apply. Okay, so um, so that is, those are the uh, kind of procedural steps you have to go through. And then I have a, a few, oh, and then wh why don't we go ahead and show you that the conclusion happens. So we, we, we should have one of each color Okay, in those pairs. Isn't that amazing? One of each color, okay? Now there's, by the way, there's a number of ways that you can um, take advantage of that guaranteed outcome for very, very surprising routines. And so one that's commonly used is to um, claim that red and black ink have different weights. If you actually look at what goes into each of those quote colors, they weigh, they weigh different amounts. And so you can claim that, boy, after years of practice and training, you've trained your hands, your fingers to be able to sense those subtle differences in weight. And so you can go like this and go, hmm, are these the same? So essentially same color or are they different colors? Uh, I, I feel like they're just a little different. I'll, I'll bet you these are different colors. Ah, they are. Let's try the next pair, okay? And kind of pretend that you're actually feeling something amazing. You can kind of tell, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, those are definitely diff different colors. Oh, you're right. Yes, you're right. And then what you do um, for some of the pairs is you kind of pretend that they weigh the same. You go, oh, yeah, those are about the same. And then the key here is you discard these. You throw them off to the side in kind of a messy fashion. And then the hope is that as you, so maybe the next pair will claim, yeah, those feel about the same. So I don't know if you can see what I'm doing here, but I'm just discarding these in, in a way that they begin to mix. And that way you've covered your tracks. If the spectator goes, now, oh, wait a second, what about the discard piles? There's something funny going on there. Well, there is, right? And so you can claim that, oh yeah, those are definitely different weights. Oh yes, I was right. I could feel that the, they were different colors. And then over here you can go, oh, those feel about the same. And then you could even come over here and just kind of be kind of sneaky in how you kind of put those together. Um, and then, you know, if you pick those up, you can accidentally, oh, oh, sorry, I, I dropped them. Well, this is all in an effort to cover your tracks so that if the spectator looks at it, they're going to go, okay, now wait a second, what is it about these, these cards that were discarded? And, and so anyway, that would cover your tracks. So that's just another way to sell it. Claim that the inks have different weights. Some people would um, use the narrative that they, the inks have different polarities, different charges. And so they might attract each other or repel, and you can feel that. And then you just go through the same sort of thing. The one that I really like is, let me just make sure that this is a post-Gilbreth packet. Post-Gilbreth packet would just be one where in pairs, they come in opposite colors in some order. We don't care about the order of the red and black, just whether each pair has one of each color. That, that would be called a post Gilbreth packet. Okay, so, um, let, so let's pretend that we've started with the red black. I did the Charlier. I had the spectator tell me how many to deal. I did the Rosette shuffle. And now I'm to that point where the Gilbreth principle applies. What you can do is just deal out the cards, one for the spectator, one for you. You're just alternately dealing. Now think about what's going to be true for each level of the piles, okay, well, for each level. Well, won't it be the case that these will be of opposite color, right? They'll be of opposite color because they were opposite. They were in pairs of opposite colors and then I alternately doubt them. But what you can do is you can turn it into a lie detection sort of routine. So you have the spectator Kind of look at their card and not show it to you. And then you ask them, what's the color of your card? Okay, and, but they're free to lie if they would like. And so they might say, uh, my card's red. Okay, and so what you do is you pick up your card and you know their card must be black, right? Because it's the opposite of this one. But you, ha you bring this card up to your ear to you know, pretend or claim that it's whispering the truth of the spectator's claim there, whether or not the spectator's being truthful. So you bring it up to your ear and claim, uh, this card says you're lying, but it says your card is actually black. And then you reveal, oh, it is. You caught me in that lie. And so you can do this as many times as you like, actually, right? Because <laughs> this card and this card will always be of opposite color. Okay, so you always know what color their card is. And then you can do it for pairs, right? You can have them pick up two of them. And you pick up two. Okay, so what do you know for sure? You know that this top card is the opposite of that one there. This card is the opposite of that one there. So once you look at your cards, you'll know that they must have a red and a black card, or if, if you want to put it in order, a black and a red, right? A black and a red, okay? So they might, you might ask them, um, okay, well, how many red cards do you have? And they'll look at them and say, uh, I don't have any red cards. And because you have these and you're looking at them, you know you, they have one of each. And so you say, uh, that's not true. You do not have two red cards, you have one of each, okay? And then they might decide to get sneakier. Maybe we'll even do three. Let's go ahead and do three. Okay. And then you pick up those cards and you ask them, okay, how many red cards and how many black cards do you have? Okay. So 
as you look at yours and bring them to your ear, you know what they have because for each red card, they have a black. And, each, and for each black card, they have a red. So just looking at this, you know they have two black cards and a red card, okay? They're gonna be looking at their cards and deciding, okay, should they tell the truth or not? But you already know what the truth is. And so if they say anything that deviates from the fact that they have one red and two black, you can tell them that they're not only lying, but you can tell them what the actual colors of the cards are as far as the number of red versus the number of black. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's called like kind of a lie detection um, routine or motif there. So there's many, many ways to take advantage of this powerful principle. And there's many card effects on YouTube where the engine driving the effect is actually the Gilbreth principle, which is purely a mathematical principle.